Tom Rosensteel is the founder and director of the Project for Excellence in Journalism, the most authoritative source for trends in the news media and media use. He is the editor and principal author of the project's annual report on the state of the news media. Those of us who try to track the many changes in our news media culture are very much in his debt. A Northern California native, Mr. Rosenstiel is a graduate of Oberlin College and has a master's degree from Columbia Journalism School. Journalist for more than 20 years, he was media critic for the Los Angeles Times and chief congressional correspondent for Newsweek magazine. He is the former executive director and current vice chairman of the Committee of Concerned Journalists, an initiative engaged in conducting a national conversation among journalists about standards and values. He is the author of six books, including with Bill Kovach. Well, that's going to be interesting. I've still got another paragraph to go. <laughs> Bill Kovach, uh, and he wrote Warp Speed, America in the Age of Mixed Media, The Elements of Journalism, What News People Should Know and the Public Should Expect, and most recently, Blur, How to Know What's True in the Age of Information Overload. Tom wrote what I consider to be one of the five best books ever written about the news media and a presidential campaign, Strange Bedfellows, How Television and the Presidential Candidates Changed American Politics in 1992. Please join me in welcoming Tom Rosenstein. Now that I have my speech, Thanks, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here today. Um, and I'm happy to say that uh, the things that I th thought I wanted to talk about actually dovetail with the things that uh, people have been talking about, uh, which is a lucky break for me. Maybe not for you, because you may have heard everything I'm going to say, but hopefully not. Can journalists still be ethical, given the speed and the challenges of new technology? Uh, of modern political campaigns? I think this question and the, th the questions that we've been discussing all morning have two dimensions. The first involves trying to identify what are the ethical responsibilities of journalists in covering a campaign. And the second involves identifying the impact that technology is having on what journalists do and what the public's learning about the campaign. To answer the first question about ethics, I go back to first principles. The purpose of the press, the reason that, it ha that it's protected in the Constitution, is to provide people with the information they require to self-govern. Elections, then, are especially important events. They are the mechanism we have for self-government. The news media's job in an election, then, is to provide citizens with information they need to determine which candidate for whom they would want to vote. And it follows, I think, that the information provided to us must be reliable, relevant, and comprehensive enough so that we can make that decision. These then, for me, form the ethical responsibilities of journalists, to provide the public with information that is reliable, relevant, and comprehensive enough for people to be able to intelligently choose among the candidates. The discussion we heard this morning in the first panel, and to some extent in the second, related to the first part of this, that the information should be accurate and reliable. This requirement of accuracy means that the press shouldn't pass along things that they know are lies, exaggerations, or rumors, and if they discover or suspect information that is unreliable, they should let us know and check it out. Seems pretty basic. Voters shouldn't be led to believe that candidate Z is a crook just because candidate Y says so. They shouldn't be left with the impression that the federal debt grew X if it isn't true. We shouldn't be misled, and we shouldn't be left simply confused by what we're being told. Now, the press, in fact, didn't always do this job of vetting campaign rhetoric as it does now. When the media were a solitary gatekeeper over what the public knew, 
a generation ago, candidates didn't have as much opportunity to, to deliver their messages without a filter. So little really got passed along or gained much momentum outside of advertising, probably, without the press vetting it beforehand in a gatekeeper manner. If a candidate said something that was so exaggerated on the stump, the boys on the bus tended to discuss it among themselves about whether it was true. And if they determined it was, many of the stories would usually criticize the, report, the candidate uh, as the information was being delivered for the first time. The bar against candidates exaggerating outrageously, spinning, telling whoppers, in other words, was higher when they needed to go through the solitary gatekeeper in a way they don't have to anymore. As campaigns evolved, things changed. In 1976, for instance, we saw the first presidential campaign with portable satellite technology that allowed candidates to be seen live on the stump in real time. Recognizing the growing supremacy of television and daily campaigning brought on by video over film, Ronald Reagan's campaign in 1980 raised uh, to new levels strategies for staging events. The photo op became a term of art. In 1984 and 1988, we began to see local television stations begin to cover presidential campaigns for the first time with their portable satellite trucks. Prior to 84, believe it or not, the three networks, ABC, NBC, and CBS, controlled all national television footage. And they did not allow their local affiliates to air any until the networks themselves had aired it first and done their own vetting and filtering. In time, particularly after Reagan, journalists began to try and develop their own strategies to push back against the new ways in which they felt they were being bypassed and manipulated. The midterm elections of 1990 were a watershed. This was the year that the press began to recognize that political advertising, 1990, that political advertising to which they paid little or no attention in previous campaigns was now reaching more people in certain elections than their coverage was. A and that the discourse from candidates on the stump, that, which was what journalists covered, was reaching. This was the year, thus, that we saw the birth of systematic truth squatting of advertising and later campaign discourse, which is now epitomized and institutionalized by factcheck.org and PolitiFact and, and some others. Truth squatting rhetoric that the press assumed voters were seeing outside the media filter was really a different role for journalists than they'd played before. In vetting advertising claims for accuracy and committing themselves uh, to calling out false claims in a systematic way, the news media had become more proactive. They moved, in effect, from being a color commentator up in the booth to being referees down on the field throwing flags. Bill Adair described himself today as an umpire. That was a role that journalists weren't willing to take, even in 1988. In my definition of the ethical campaign responsibilities of the press, this is the right role to play. And as the number of channels by which political actors have to communicate with voters directly grow, this role of what I would call authenticating rhetoric for veracity is arguably more critical than it's ever been. And I would add that it's not enough to simply call out that some claim is exaggerated or mistaken. Once that affirmation has been deemed unreliable, that really should become part of the public's ongoing knowledge. If a candidate persists in exaggerating or misrepresenting, the obligation here for the press requires that it continue to point this out and do it in such a way that other journalists begin to point it out too. You are trying to help the public. PolitiFact is very aggressive about this. They do a good job of, of putting um, a lot of effort into marketing their findings to multiple audiences across into the broader stream of media beyond their own website. This is good marketing for PolitiFact, but I, I would argue it's also good for the public. So this brings us to the more subtle, complicated uh, parts of the press's responsibility in my construction. We need information that's relevant and comprehensive. Relevant information, I think, means that we need to learn things about the candidates that would tell us who these people really are and what they might actually do if they were elected in office. 
not just the image in the campaign that they're trying to project. To do that, I think we need a range of information from the press. We'd want to know what these candidates would do if they were elected. That means we need to know what they're proposing they would do, what their pro policy proposals are. We'd want to know what they'd done in the past, how they actually behaved when they were in office before. That would be their past record. <laughs> We'd also want to know what they're like, how they make decisions, what they're like personally, their character. And to some degree, we'd want to know about how they perform as candidates under fire, their performance, how they run their campaigns, their strategic and tactical decision making. Comprehensiveness, the second part of this, implies two things for me. It means that we need to know enough about the candidate, a full picture of them, not just part of it, so that we have a pretty good fix on who these guys are. That implies that we get the right mix of information. And a comprehensive understanding of the campaign for me also means something else. Teddy White, the journalist who's probably the father of modern political reporting, at least for those of us who are old enough to remember him, the grandfather of modern political reporting maybe, believed that national elections were also windows on the nation, a chance to discover the public's aspirations, its goals and fears. He thought that was as much the story as the candidates were. This would mean a requirement to understand the public deeply. Some journalists have even suggested that the press should cover campaigns as if they were massive job interviews. What would you want to know about someone you were looking to hire? That, in effect, is what we're doing here. We're considering hiring these candidates to be president or governor or whatever for a few years. This job interview metaphor also covers the idea of covering the community, the voter. The first thing you do when you hire somebody is identify the needs of what your organization is on. So how is the press performing uh, on these issues of relevance and comprehensiveness? What has it given us? At my think tank, the Project for Excellence in Journalism at the Pew Research Center, we monitor campaign coverage from 55 major news outlets every day and break down the coverage by category. Here's what we found. This is the complicated part of the presentation. I have to make the slides work. Aha! The slides are backwards. Here's what we found. <laughs> um, we are getting a lot more coverage of who is winning and why rather than who these guys are. Since November 2011, Horse race and strategy have accounted for half of all the coverage we've studied. And by coverage, we mean the space in newspapers or the time on, uh, and websites and the time on uh, television or radio. But if you did it by story, uh, as opposed to space, the numbers would be essentially identical. Uh, these numbers, by the way, are even higher right now. The, stra the tactical and strategic frames are, are um, about 65%. Advertising money have made up another 17%. Policy proposals of the candidates, both domestic and foreign, made up 12. The public record of the candidates, their, how they behaved in, in office, five. Personal issues, um, their family, their marriages, how much taxes they've paid, their religion, uh, another 11. The electorate, by the way, the voter, other than horse race, uh, is very small. It's a rounding error, error inside other. Uh, and um, fact checking of advertising rhetoric uh, is inside public record. Is this the right mix? This is a long, uh, raging argument. Journalists defending, these numbers, by the way, are very typical of what you would see in past races. Journalists often argue that how a candidate runs his or her campaign is a window on character. They also argue that who is winning and losing at any moment is the news, and that the race aspect of a campaign is inherently interesting, so it's a way to engage the public. The critics have long argued that the press is wrong in this argument, that the focus on strategy and tactics, which is actually really this horse race stuff, is, is really about strategy and tactics more than it is who's ahead and who's not. 
uh, is something that only really political junkies and insiders care about, and that you're teaching people how to be political consultants, not how to not giving them information they need as voters, and they're skeptical that the way a candidate's campaign is run is necessarily a proxy or a window on how they that candidate would govern. Recently, there has come to be yet another argument uh, that this familiar debate over media framing is out of date. What the media publish, its news agenda, doesn't matter. If consumers want to know about a candidate's positions, they can get that information from any number of sources now, particularly online. Everything is archived. Everything is available. These policy positions are always there. This new argument, I think, is very convenient because it makes the whole business of media ethics uh, about what the media cover and, and not cover disappear. Who cares what the media chose, choose to focus on? It's now the consumer's responsibility to find the information that he or she needs and considers relevant because everything's available, problem solved. I hereby declare the conference over, and we can take the afternoon off. <laughs> the problem with this new you believe it or not, I don't really accept this last argument. The problem with this new argument is that it ignores the reality of audience behavior. Not every website that is available is equally trafficked. Like it or not, the data will tell us that the old media still play a substantial role in shaping what the public know and what the public worry about. This is also something that we track at the Pew Research Center. And here's what we found. This is where people say they uh, have learned most about the campaign. And what it shows us is that cable news is now the number one source for political information in the United States. Uh, this is, uh, for, we found this to be true for the first time in this year. Uh, it, it moved ahead at 36% uh, uh, of local news. Local news four years ago was at 40%, dropped to 32%. Almost every media sector is dropping in terms of its audience, um, except for the internet, which is stable, and cable, which is also about stable. Newspapers fell to 20%, down from 31 four years ago. Network news fell to 26%, down from 31. The internet is where it was four years ago, at 25%, as a source for regular political information. And on the internet, by the way, we asked where, what specific sources people went to. And the most popular destinations for campaign information online are overwhelmingly the websites and apps of traditional media outlets. If you look at less traditional sources, the numbers, as you can see on the, on the slide, are much smaller. Just 6% of the public regularly gets campaign information from Facebook. Twitter's at 2%. 3% regularly go to YouTube. 15% of Americans have ever visited a candidate website. The number of regular visits would be much lower. And for what it's worth, 72% of Americans say they have seen or heard political campaign commercials. So that's probably the number one source of information for uh, the campaign. So we have many more channels of information, but the old ones are much more important still than many people think, even if they are not as important as they once were. And these different channels of information operate in very different ways, offering us very different kinds of information. We track each week, for instance, the conversation about the campaign on Twitter. What we see is it tends to be highly negative, often focused around outrage, often mocking the candidates. Humor is a large part of it. The one exception to this in the six months we've been tracking uh, the Twitter conversation about each candidate is Ron Paul. The conversation about Ron Paul is positive on Twitter, and he's the only candidate who can claim that, although in the last two weeks it, it has uh, flipped. Blogs, by contrast, appear to be a place where people who have already made up their mind want to express it in a fairly static and unchanging way week in and week out. Regardless of the news, we see very little deviation in the tone across blogs uh, about the campaign. 
almost no change in these something like 30 weeks we've been tracking it. The narrative on news sites and legacy news platforms, by contrast, is much more fluid. It changes with changing events. The tone about the candidate varies heavily based on fairly objective measures of performance, how well they did in debates, their poll movement, the results in, 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 in primaries. New information about what happened is rapidly reported. This fluidity and this level of new information, I suspect, is why audiences continue to gravitate to old media sources on a regular basis. And because their audience is bigger than non-traditional news sources, these old media still influence to some degree how the candidates behave, though not nearly as much as they once did. So this brings me to the last point, the second dimension that I wanted to talk about, uh, which is uh, whether the press is uh, living up to its responsibilities now, given new technology. The real impact of new technology on the race is not that it's changing where people get their information, as much, I think, as it's changing the nature of the information that we're getting, including from the old media. One change is that traditional journalists are more passive. More of their time is spent synthesizing material that is coming to them through email, Twitter, YouTube, etc., and less time is spent going out proactively and answering their own questions. More time is also spent distributing their material through these channels, writing multiple versions of their stories on multiple platforms and in different formats. In the years I've been looking at this, and I covered, David Hoffman and I used to be uh, campaign mates uh, tracking around these guys. Um, Almost every presidential campaign is also partly a story of changing technology. And often the winner in the race is the candidate who understands where the technology is moving and exploits it first. Kennedy's grasp of television in 1960, Reagan's of television in 1980, Clinton's grasp of new media forms such as call-in and entertainment programs in 1992, the impact of email in 2004, or Obama's use of websites for fundraising and YouTube channels for energizing his base in 2008. This year has been described as the Twitter campaign. I see something very different. We have so many outlets covering events continuously that I see two effects that I would call acceleration and liquefaction. The acceleration is obvious, with more politics playing out, out online and on 24-hour cable. The narrative shifts much much more quickly than it ever has before. The question is not what happened this week or even yesterday, as it is what happened this morning versus what happened this afternoon. In our data, when Rick Santorum won the Iowa caucuses, his so-called bump in the media lasted less than a day. There were so many polls, his victory was not really a surprise. The New York Times was ready the day he won the Iowa caucuses with its first story taking a new, second, more skeptical look at his record, the kind of story that we would have seen a few years ago, a few days later. The half-life of a story on the website Politico is a few hours. We have daily tracking polls that tell us something that may or may not be real, daily changes in the preferences for each candidate. We see the race played out in real time, the vote totals dribbling in, the candidate appearances live, the back and the forth. This has also, I think, made it harder for candidates to sustain momentum. Consider how many candidates came and went before any votes were cast in 2011. This is the acceleration. The second part of the equation, liquefaction, is more subtle. We have more media reporting more political news than, we've ever, than we have political news to report. On election nights, maybe seven minutes of news becomes chewed over for hours. Illusory movements and daily tracking polls as, are covered as if they're meaningful, though they, in fact they are media creations. The news is masticated over and over until it becomes, to me, thin and uninteresting. You hear the same ideas repeated over and over, even the same phrases. It isn't possible to fill all this time with actual reporting, 
So another feature of the new media culture is that the narrators of the election are no longer journalists. On cable, they're often political operatives, described as our insiders or analysts, who have agendas that are not journalistic but are political and really are a form of spin doctrine. On blogs, the narration is usually from political activists. And as you'll see, I hope, on the video that I'm about to share, sometimes the narratives are network celebrities who the networks want to put out to feature who may or may not know much about politics. Watch in this clip for Pierce Morgan being shouted down. OK, my uh, able assistant here is going to help me. very, very small numbers of numbers, but here's what we've got here uh, in terms of uh, our, our Iowa results thus, for, thus far. Uh, nine, four, and three, those are vote totals. Uh, right now, 43%, uh, 19%, and 14%, the division of labor between Ron Paul, Rick Perry, and Mitt Romney. Uh, this is only 1% of the vote in, so extrapolate from this at your peril. I'm going to pull up a couple of different tweets, because I know Dan talked to someone who said, you know, a Democrat in Michigan wanted to take a shower after voting for Santorum. This person voted for Santorum. I just voted for Santorum here in this Michigan. This person is a cat. With this person hat. is a cat with a hat. We're we, we do not cat judge. Here. We're okay. quoting a cat. You're Barack right. Obama. You want this over, don't you? Because then you can go at one guy. No, no, no. You want this guy. I want this guy. I want this guy. But I think this talk of a brokered convention really just reflects this general sense that Romney just hasn't been able to close the deal among conservatives. Has Mitt Romney sealed the deal with real conservatives? Close the deal right now. I haven't been able to close the deal. He can't seal the deal. Close the deal. Seal that deal. Close the deal. He can't close the deal. Well, they can't close the deal. Seal the deal. Close the deal. Close the deal. Mitt Romney primary knockout. One two punch. Knockout punch. Knockout punch. A knockout punch. Throw a punch. Punch a bat. Knockout punch. The old storyline that he can't close the deal will be tomorrow's headline yet again. At least some CNN anchors chose to kill time the old-fashioned way, a leisurely stroll to the queue. Let's go over the queue to our political director, Mark Preston, check in with him, try to get a sense of when we may be able to project an actual winner in the state of Michigan, uh, now that obviously all the polls are closed and we've gotten so many of the votes in. So CNN's cube, or nerd terrarium, if you will, <laughs> is populated with individuals on headsets. Yet, to get information from them, you must pack some gorp and hike the canyon. <laughs> and I think Coop's the only guy over there fit enough to make that journey. I assume the trek was worth Anderson's while. Mark, what are you uh, what are you hearing? So we actually had some some breaking news out of Michigan right now, Anderson. Um, we don't know who's going to win Michigan, and we don't know who's going to win a bulk of the delegates. <laughs> you you better be going somewhere with this point next week. We can now, based upon our calculations from what our decision team has found out, is awards three delegates not only to Mitt Romney but also to Rick Santorum. So to, to each of them, they each get three at this point. <laughs> Cooper added, don't ever call me to the cube again. You understand? <laughs> Never. So, <laughs> what, I get paid to watch this stuff. What are the ethical implications of acceleration and liquefaction? The first implication is that accuracy becomes uh, more difficult when the news is uh, delivered so quickly, so iteratively. This is almost a physical law of journalism. Speed is always the enemy of accuracy. The second dimension is that good information is crowded out, I think, by bad or uninteresting. There is so much talk about things that are partial or meaningless, so much repetition, so much spin, that the good stuff, which is there, is more easily missed. It matters not just how many valuable stories were produced, but also how many not so valuable stories we have to sift through as well. And the third effect involves polls and framing. My uh, late friend and the great, great media scholar Jim Carrey made this point a long time ago that one potential problem of polling is that it turns the public into an abstraction in which people are responding to questions that are created by pollsters rather than offering their own thoughts 
framed their own way. Since Jim made that point, the number of polls in each election cycle keeps ex increasing exponentially. And most of these newer polls are very quick questionnaires that track just a few horse race questions. They're not the kind of deeper polls that we saw uh, 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 being discussed in, in, in the second uh, panel today that probe uh, the minds and behavior of voters more deeply and tell us something more lasting. Thus, these newer polls tend to flatten our perceptions of the electorate even more, making them even more a media-created abstraction that is shallow. For all the coverage, all the hours, more has, sin has been said about horse race than I needed to know, and less has been said about the character of the country and the, char the character of the candidates than I would like to know. After all this coverage, the primary actor, or the main actor in the primary drama, Mitt Romney, seems strangely remote to me. I know less about what he's like as an executive, as a decision maker, or under pressure than I would have thought. I mainly know that he is an awkward campaigner and that the GOP primary voters are not enthusiastic about him, that he cannot close the deal. This deeper look at candidates is harder to get at than it once was, I know. The candidates keep themselves at greater distance from reporters than they once did. Their campaigns are more artificially, are art, more artificial and more controlled creations than they once were. And what I'm talking about requires real reporting, digging, not just watching the day's events, the day's performance, the newest numbers, and commenting on them. The great challenge for us as the public going forward is whether the story of these two contenders that we now have and where they will take the country will be told as well as, as the story of how they run their campaigns and where they stand in the numbers. If I look back to the three last presidential contests since 2000, I would say that we have not well understood the men who won the presidency. Bush ran as a bipartisan, compassionate conservative and he didn't really govern that way. Obama appeared to be such a gifted communicator that he offered the promise of healing our political polarization and governing in a new way. Yet he has proven to be a strangely ineffective communicator who's been trapped by polarization. I don't know if we were misled, but the coverage of those races, as with this one, were so heavily focused on the campaigns that were projected to us and not on the essential character of the men in whose names those campaigns were being waged. The irony, I think, is that individually, journalists are better prepared than they used to be. They have more information at their command. They are more serious and more objective than they've ever been. But their task is much harder because they have so much more to do. They have to do it in real time and have so many other voices to contend with. In the end, rather than using the technology, I think at the moment it is using us. And much of what we get to, from this campaign is not reporting. It is political spin enabled by the media that, oper that allow these folks to talk to us in the name of journalism. For all the very good reporting I have seen this year, the whole to me seems less than the parts. The whole is like music played so loud through a speaker system that it's become fuzzy and distorted. Are journalists meeting their ethical responsibilities? I think this is harder than it used to be. And I think individually, many journalists are. Yet somehow, I think collectively, the media are not. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. As expected, a, a beautifully written and uh, delivered message about the concern for journalism ethics and, and our political campaigns. Uh, Tom says he's fine to handle the questions himself. Uh, I just remind you that don't, uh, you need to have a microphone in front of you before you start speaking, so you get to pick who gets to talk. Oh, I get to pick, huh? <laughs> Not that guy with his hand raised over there. <laughs> 
Uh, my name is David Hoffman, and as Tom mentioned, I covered some of those campaigns, and I was one of the boys on the bus in Reagan's 1980 campaign. And I had read the And boys. he was a boy back then. Yeah. <laughs> but I, and I remember well, for example, the night that Reagan uh, spoke into a mic, he didn't realize we were listening, and announced that trees cause pollution, which we had a lot of fun with the next day. But my question is, the boys on the bus were an important part of the process. We would make decisions, we would fact check, we would truth squad, we would write. And uh, I now, at least from a distance, look at the campaign buses and see they're largely filled with people that are producing. Um, I see candidates who don't want to interact at all for weeks or months at a time. Um, I don't want to be nostalgic, but is there some way forward to reclaim that uh, territory in the age we live in? Do you think that that's part of the problem that you describe of the technology eating us? Yeah, it, you know, it's really interesting because I my first race was 84 and, and then I did them through to 96. And um, if you go back, Jim was talking about this yesterday, if you go back and you look at some of this older coverage, the, the, the these were veteran political reporters who wrote what they thought. They There was a lot of judgment in the coverage. I remember the first campaign I covered, uh, I, I, it must have been 88, where I met David Broder and I, and I, you know, you're sitting in the bar and we used to go to the bar back then. And, you know, what do you think of Gephardt? And he said, not ready for prime time. You know, and here's David Broder. Well, David Broder was sort of the arbiter of what was ready for prime time. And if he made a judgment that this guy was not ready to be president, that actually mattered. And it would, and he'd, he'd convey that in, in the stories. Uh, but he covered campaigns since the early 1960s and was the dean of political writers and was even granted a column in the Post. Um, gradually what happened was, though, uh, first, political reporting did, stopped being a lifetime career. The, the number of people who would do it, as Broder did, uh, for 30 or 40 or 50 years, that, there are very, very few who do that. So we don't have a, that many folks who have... Um, the kind of collective uh, memory that um, Drummond, uh, Broder, the, the, the boys who were covered in the boys on the bus uh, developed. Um, the other, when you go on, and, and one of the reasons for that is because covering campaigns became less interesting, less nourishing. You had less power. You were, you, you had been put in a passive position. And, and so uh, folks like Paul Taylor, who's my friend, stopped Stopped doing it. He was a potential inheritor of, uh, of of Broder's job and decided this is not a nourishing way to spend my life. There are a few who who uh, who are doing it, but but not as many. The second thing is that being on the bus or on the plane with a candidate is not a particularly good vantage point to cover campaigns. So if you're the most senior political writer, you're actually back somewhere else in a different space than the candidate is because you've determined that, that you're a captive there. Um, so the interactions that w with the candidates are, um, are, not, are no longer personal. Um, uh, I mean, if you go back and you read the, the uh, uh, Teddy White's books, there were meetings where if a guy wanted to run for president, and it was, a guy, it was always a guy back then, they would, they would have dinner with an elite group of political writers in Washington, and whether they performed well determined whether or not they thought they could run. These guys, in a sense, were sort of like uh, a, a part of the search committee process of, of deciding who, could, who the candidates could be. All that is gone, and it, it's gone in part because the campaigns have so many other channels, and in part because um, they know how to um, minimize the, the impact of, of political writers and, 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 and diminish that filter. Is there a way to um, go back and push against that? I, I, I don't think so, um, unless we could get um, the, the, the spin doctors off the air and elevate the handful of political um, uh, folks like a, a Dan Balls of the Washington Post or Karen Tumulter or Ron Brownstein and say, you're going to sit in these chairs, but we're not going to let other people do that. And, and that's just not going to happen. Not when MSNBC is trying to get a young demographic and so they've got, you know, uh, 
all hosts who are you know under the age of thirty or something like that. It's I I just don't see a way for this to happen. I you know I I think that uh, the the only good news is that voters are seeking out to some extent the valuable information, the older sources, um, but. You know, there's just too many ways around the gate. Um, there's, there's sort of a, um, I understand the assumption that when there was a smaller group that could do the early vetting, you managed to quash stuff further. It seems to me that's also at the heart of the critique of the old system, that yeah. there were too few people involved, given that there's now greater breadth. Yeah. Um, are there thing, are there good things that have come out of that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, one of the things that always struck me about the um, political uh, the, the notion that the uh, press covered uh, the public discourse was that it didn't cover the public discourse. It had covered the official discourse and the establishment discourse. We actually have a much better sense of the public discourse now. Um, if you want to slog through all the blogs and the tw and the tweets and all the rest. Um, to some extent, that public discourse is not always rational. Um, you know, uh, we've all had the experience of, if you're a reporter, of interviewing voters, and they connect the dots in ways that don't make sense, that you wouldn't expect, and yet they're making decisions that way. Um, uh, I always, uh, uh, Bud Lewis, who was the pollster at the LA Times who taught me a lot about polling, used to say that the public is ignorant but wise. They often use the wrong equations and come to the right answers by accident. Um, uh, so that's, I mean, one, that, that's one positive, is that we actually know more. Another positive is that movements can emerge very quickly outside the sphere of the establishment. The Tea Party movement is an example of that. Um, that's not, that was not the creation of Fox News. That was an organic thing. Um, Obama's candidacy was an organic thing. Um, now, you can make an argument that, um, you know, that's devalued experience and that Barack Obama wasn't ready to be president. Um, you know, the parallels to Jimmy Carter maybe, you know, uh, connect in some other ways as well. As with anything, people say, you know, okay, it works this way now. Is that better or worse? And the answer inevitably is yes. chart you shared showing the preference or people's uh, indication of what news source they relied on, I'm wondering if we missed something in that chart. And part of it is, I don't think people are particularly good at indicating where they're learning from the news. That's one. And second, I, I think we conflate oftentimes when we look at those kinds of charts, dosage versus potency. Two different medicines, both maybe 10 milligrams, but you might learn a lot more from one news source than another. And for example, Facebook, Twitter, if we know the people who are sending us information, it's much more persuasive. It may be also much less credible, right? So I'm wondering if those kinds of charts, in a way, hinder our understanding of what's actually happening in the new media environment relative to just giving us a sense that cable news is very prominent and, and Twitter isn't. And I think secondly, even within that framework, I think you even hinted at this, a lot of journalists are relying on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook as their sources for news. So we're seeing a new kind of agenda setting function in that process as well. And I wonder if you can comment on both those ideas. Yeah. Um, we've, we've, we've probed this a little bit. Um, you know, first of all, only 13% of American adults are on Twitter. Um, so there is a limit, even if, even if it's in a fascinating new uh, uh, way of getting information. Um, I think one thing that dampens, uh, 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 dampens the impact of Twitter and to some extent Facebook is that it is discussion. It's not new information. So if you want to find out what Mitt Romney said yesterday, it's not a particularly good source for going there. And we've asked uh, people how, what percentage of people get, have ever gotten a story uh, or clicked on a story on Facebook that has been recommended to them by friends and, and, and things like that. The numbers aren't that huge yet. I think they'll grow. Um, but uh, because it's new, there's a fascination, and we tend to think this is the next new thing, that this is the Twitter campaign. Um, I, I'm, you know, I, I look, I'm looking at a, at a lot of this data, and not just, um, you know, not just those poll numbers, but um, the traffic numbers to websites, uh, you know, the internals uh, from uh, 
um, uh, when news organizations share with us what things are being, uh, you, know, you know, what stories are, are being read most heavily and things like that, and what's being shared. We ask people, uh, when, you've, when you get news from Facebook that has been recommended to you, are these stories that you would not have seen otherwise? And overwhelmingly, people tell us that on Facebook, what they click on are stories that they would have read elsewhere because they're brands or you know, organizations that they know. That is less true on Twitter. On Twitter, people get uh, have a, a much more diverse kind of universe of things that they're following, and they tell us that they are more likely to click on things that they wouldn't have encountered elsewhere. The you know I think Twitter is new enough; we don't know what the scale is going to be. Um, uh, so I think this is something to watch. But um, if I were running for office, I'd buy a lot of TV ads. Is there anything uh, in the research, uh, you talk about the, the horse race aspect, that it changes as time goes on, as we get closer to the general election, for example, and we have two candidates that we're now comparing side by side, that people, that the media will start to look, focus a little bit more on issues, or does it just become more of the same horse race stuff? That's a really good question, because we just went through this period where, um, you know, there was a contest every week or every, or even sometimes more often. So it, it was a horse race, although it, I don't know if it was a horse race as much as a kind of, you know, slog to inevitability. I mean, we ended up here, after all this and all the money and everything, we ended up where every political reporter I know predicted we'd be in July, last July. So this was, I mean, that's a function of who ran more than anything else. But it, I think it was very strange that we started tracking uh, the coverage in July last year. And the, the press narration of the race, six months before any votes were going to be cast, was as if we were in primary season. You know, there were tracking polls, uh, and it was, we were already in horse race mode. There was somewhat more coverage of who these guys are and, and, and things like that. Um, but, you know, the, the, the the largest amount of material about the candidates probably came from debates that were staged, not from shoe leather reporting, even during that period. So you had these candidates kind of, there, there was a demand for a race when there was yet no race, uh, at least no race that involved the public, except in, in, a, in some polling. Um, so that was, uh, you know, that, that makes me wonder what's going to happen now. Because normally, you would have this period of, a, of an extended a examination where these guys would shake the etch-a-sketch and reintroduce themselves to the public. Uh, good luck doing that, I think, by the way. Uh, whoever's running with an etch-a-sketch is kind of missing out on the fact that we're in the digital age. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the stock went up. Well, okay. There's that. Um, uh, but I'm I'm a little nervous that we're gonna we're gonna have daily tracking. I mean, when I started covering politics, when I was a lad, uh, it was considered unethical to release daily tracking poll results because the numbers in the sample were too small to be meaningful. Now those are released on a regular basis from robocalls. Um, with 10%, you know, uh, uh, acceptance rates to the to the surveys, um, uh, and it's hard to know. There's no way to know how accurate, you know, the tracking polls are. We only know how accurate the last polls are going to be. Um, so I'm I'm a little nervous that what should be now a kind of taking of breath and a re and a, and a closer look at who these guys are is going to be instead. Well, gee, in July, Romney closed the gap. He was actually up in early August, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, which uh, you know doesn't mean much. Now, one thing that did change in the time that I've watched this and been a, and been a professional journalist is it used to be that not much mattered before Labor Day. And I think now you can win these races over the summer. 
Uh, Clinton ran advertising in 96 uh, so early, unprecedentedly early, and the number by basically before the before the conventions, the numbers were pretty set, and Dole, you know, never moved. Uh, so I think it's possible that you can, um, you know, that this that, that this campaign can be won outside of the uh, traditional conventions of of when people are paying attention. The, it, it, particularly if it's a race that's going to be lopsided. My guess is, is this is not going to be a race that's going to be lopsided. So my question pertains a little bit more to Wisconsin. Right now, obviously, we have the recall issue that's going on. And one concern from a journalist, I'm a morning anchor in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And one issue that has arose is the recall petition signatures and across the state that there have been reporters and public figures, um, newspaper journalists who have signed that petition. And so, and with that, we also get the calls at our station, one way or the other, hey, you're being biased toward this candidate, and then the next second, it's the other candidate that you get a call about. So ethically, is it unethical when you are in that role as a reporter, as a media personnel, to do those things, and do you feel that that has changed throughout time? I may be old school. I think that's unethical. I think that when you become a journalist, you decide to take on the role of being a com what I call a co what borrowing a phrase from another editor, uh, the committed observer. In the same way that a doctor signs a Hippocratic oath, so that when people come into the emergency room, you have an ethical obligation to treat whoever's hurt the worst. So if there's a tor horrible shootout and the bad guy kills some cops and then he gets shot up and they bring four people into the emergency room, if the bad guy is hurt worst and needs treatment first, ethically the doctor is required to treat the bad guy first. It's something that you do where you leave your sort of your, your personal morals at the OR door and you take on this professional role. Lawyers have an ethical obligation to provi pro uh, 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 provide a, uh, you know, the, the best defense to hideous people. And that's, a, and, and that's understood as, and if they don't do it, they can actually be disbarred. Although we don't have licensing, the ethical obligation, I think, for journalists is you decide that you, if you're going to do this profession, and to me it is a profession, you abandon certain rights that you have as a, in terms of your activities as a citizen, and you fulfill your citizenship, professionally at least, um, by being an observer on behalf of the rest of your citizen, of the rest of, the, of, the, of your fellow citizens, and your your ability to observe credibly means you need to maintain some independence. It's not a great price to pay to say I'm not going to make contributions to political campaigns. I'm not going to sign petitions. I'm, uh, you know, I'm I, I and. Um, there are there's some elasticity here. If you're the food writer, it's probably okay to be the head of the PTA. If you're the education writer, it's not. If you are the you know if you're a, a, a morning anchor and you're and you're going to narrate political news, I say you got to stay out of it, um, or get another job. It's not that much to ask. I mean, I, in 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 one of my books, the elements of journalism, my friend Bill Kovach and I wrote that it was not okay for the New York Times to allow a reporter to continue to cover the White House after he'd married the president's former press secretary. He accused us of saying that his children should not have been born. We said, no, we got no objection. You're marrying her. Our objection was to your continuing to cover the White House. You hurt the New York Times. So a quick follow-up to that uh, question, and I appreciate your answer. How do you then uh, translate that to members of the public who disagree and say, I'd rather um, know that the journalist signed or didn't sign a recall petition. I'd rather see a yard sign in a journalist's uh, lawn. Um, and in fact, that journalists give up their constitutional rights uh, when 
they agree or their employers ask them not to make political campaigns, not to participate in public political life? The reason that I, th I think that, you know, the, the, the sort of the uh, slate view that you could, um, you know, if you just are open about your biases, then everybody knows and, and it's actually more honest. The reason I don't buy that is it suggests that journalists have no pr ability to rise, a a to be professionals and to cover things in a way where they can overcome and be, f where they can be fair and overcome their own personal predilections. Um, I just reject that. I think that I know journalists who can do it. I believe I did it. Uh, and, uh, and it is a process. It, re it requires true intellectual discipline and professionalism and, uh, and procedures for ensuring that you're doing it. It requires an open newsroom where, you can, where people can accuse, can say, look, I, don't, I think you got a problem in the way you wrote the story, and you can argue it. Um, it's, the same, it's the same thing that uh, you, know, you do as a political scientist when you do the research. You look at the evidence, and you don't just sort of uh, say, this is what I think. Um, it's called professionalism. And um, the answer to professionalism is not to give up and put a yard sign on your lawn. Hi. Uh, I'm very interested in what you were saying earlier about Twitter and um, how negativity and humor are often used. Um, I'm a student journalist. I follow a lot of young journalists like Dave Weigel and the folks at BuzzFeed. And they're really funny guys. Um, and I worry that the clip that you showed is what's going to end up happening with these non-traditional outlets when they mature, that you know, because they're so humorous that it's just going to turn into the same kind of thing. Um, do you think that there's a way or any lessons that young journalists can take about how to avoid being perceived as the same kind of like beltway insider who's sort of focused too much on horse race coverage while at the same time uh, you know being effective reporters like like Weigel or you know the people at BuzzFeed are yeah uh, I don't know if this is going to answer it exactly but uh Increasingly, I, I, I've come to believe that there is a bias or a – bias might be the wrong word, but th there's sort of a, a, a tendency built into each technology. Um, and the very best journalists I know are conscious of it and fight against being victim or being manipulated by that by whatever that particular bias is. Let me explain what I mean by that. In print, the bias is to shovel lots of facts and information into your stories, but not do much in terms of storytelling. The bias of television is that it's easy to make a story emotional, but you have to fight against the tendency to do that by making sure that there's real information in the story. Um, the bias in radio is to tell a story. That, you know, a lot, there's a lot of very skilled storytelling in radio, but sometimes the stories don't mean anything if, if you just sort of go along with that. Um, online, there are potentially a lot of different biases, one of which, but the one that seems dominant at the moment is speed, to tell stories iteratively. Um, the very best journalists that I've ever seen are aware of the bias, and so the best TV writers, the best TV journalists, say, I'm going to use the power, the emotional power of television with stories that have depth and real information. The best uh, print uh, writers I've ever met were people who m really were great storytellers and marshaled information in ways where the stories were compelling and, and became true because of, the, the, because of the, pa the, the power of the information, but not just sort of shoveling facts into a kind of jumbled story. Um, these technologies are so new, we're not, we haven't even discovered what these tendencies are. Um, but the most obvious ones would be, I can get more followers doing this. I can get more visits doing that on my website. Um, so the question when you have metrics is, 
which metrics do you value? And this is a big thing in television where, you know, once minute by minute ratings, minute to minute ratings came in, uh, a lot of stations said, well, let's just do whatever will juice the minute to minute ratings. And in the end, they made newscasts that only contained a certain kinds of stories because those were the stories that they diminished the audience overall by narrowing the focus of what the news was contained in their newscast. Mm -hmm. So you have to be, you know, you have to be very wise about, okay, am I gonna, am I gonna kind of go with the flow, or am I gonna recognize the flow and commit myself to doing serious work with this medium? Last question. Sorry. Um, in an age of user-generated content on Twitter, YouTube, etc., do you see an overall benefit of this fast information, despite the fact that it might not be verified or journalistic? Is it a benefit in and of itself to give all people a chance to participate and share? Yes, obviously, of course. Um, we, as I said, we have more information, um, uh, but you need to make sense of it. I think about, uh, as an analogy, the use of embedded reporters. People used to talk during the Gulf War. Is this good or bad that you have embedded reporters? Well, in the first Gulf War, we basically, the reporters were shut out. So the war was conducted without reporters. They just were in Bahrain at the blue umbrellas, um, or the blue cabanas, or whatever those things were. Uh, at the second Gulf War, they created the embedded reporter system. The best use of the embedded reporters were the newscasts and the and the and the and the, and the accounts in newspapers and radio where they took many different embedded accounts and put them together the worst use of embedded reporters is where you just went to one embedded reporter who had that so straw view and he or she said this is what is seen i'm seeing right now what you ended up with in in, in that instance was um, a reporter who was essentially just conveying the vantage point of the reporters uh, of the soldiers that he or she was with the real value was in putting these things together i think to some extent that's where we uh, are going to be with all this new material that's coming in one example would be consider the difference between comments at the bottom of stories versus using your network of your audience or, 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 or recognizing your audience as a community of people with real expertise who you could tap into before when you're, still, when you're doing your reporting to inform your work and bring in many more points of view than you would have otherwise. That's a true melding of reporting value and your audience uh, input as opposed to the, you know, the self-selected uh, you know, group of people who decide that they want to vent with, uh, by posting comments at the bottom of the stories. They're both user-generated content, but they serve very different purposes and, and inform the journalism in different ways. Oh, is that it? OK. Thank you very much. Tom, uh, your project for excellence is an incredible contribution to the, our public sphere and our understanding of journalism and the public. And you are, we are so uh, happy to have you amongst us and to come and visit us and share your, your very nuanced thoughts on this very difficult, uh, these very difficult issues. Thank you again.